I want to welcome you back to the 11th hour today. It's going to be a powerful 11th hour. Now let's pray. Father, I thank you so much, Lord, for this day. I thank you for our partners that are watching. Lord God, I ask you to give us eyes to see and ears to hear that we can learn your word together as a family. And I give you praise and honor for it in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to look over at Deuteronomy chapter 30 for just a, uh, a moment and verse 19. Would you listen to this? It says, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that both thou and thy seed may live. You know, choice is a powerful thing. It can alter the destiny of men. Everything the enemy does must be kept. It must be kept in the arena of choice, or it will risk the wrath of God and the rebellion of man. Yet if a man chooses something, then they will not resist their own decision. Now, I want you to think about that a minute. Choice can alter destiny. But see, everything the enemy does, he has to keep it in the arena of choice. Because if he forces it into the earth, since the earth was given to the children of men, then he risks the wrath of God and the rebellion of a man or of men. But if a man chooses, if he can present it and the man chooses it, then a man won't resist his own decision. Now, this is what the Lord has spoke to me about. He said men would rule the Lord if they could. If wicked men could know him in his splendor, they would uh, soon plot to harness him and to use God the Almighty. They'd soon plot to do that if they could do it, but they can't. They would use him for their own power. They would seek, and they seek this now. I want you to listen to this. They're pushing, those that are pushing the AI generation, like Noah Harari, will lead men into hell. This is exactly what would happen. If it is not so, then why is every speech he mentions, or he, he, he always mentions in his speeches, God? Then he pinpoints what God that is. It's the God of the Hebrew Bible. Because the powers that be know that the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the King of glory, is the only real, true God. And these men know he must be dealt with in the minds of the people first. In doing this uh, all the time, he is also proving in all their minds, it's showing us that in their minds they know who God really is. God is not a make-believe being. God is not a bunny that lays eggs. He is real and he is powerful, and he can do anything. He is the almighty God, the El Shaddai. They also know that men have a choice. So without fear they will, uh, of risking his wrath, they keep it all in the realm of decision for all humans. As long as it is in the realm of decision, they are safe from his wrath. They also know that dictatorship forced on people risk not only the wrath of the Almighty, but also if dictatorship is chosen by the people, then it is a rule that sticks. If the spirit that drove Hitler had have gotten the world to choose him, he could have won and ruled for a while. Choice is a powerful thing. It must be kept uh, in the realm of decision at all times. Then when the Antichrist reigns, no one will resist it. Why? Because they chose it. 
I want you to notice this too. For the first three and a half years of the tribulation period, it is by choice that people take the mark. The last three and a half years, it is mandatory. It is kelp in the realm of decision until he figures he has enough hold to enforce it. But there will be 144,000 Jewish people who will not bow and two prophets who will withstand him. The Antichrist is just that. He is the anti-anointed one and anti-anointing. If the anointing removes burdens and yokes are destroyed because of it, then the anti-anointed one and his anti-anointing will put burdens on people and forge yokes to place on people. But it all must be kept in the realm of decision. Whoever will not, listen to this now, whoever will not receive his mark, that's choice. Whoever will not receive his mark in their right hand or between their eyes and their forehead, then he will cause them to be put to death. Now I want you to listen to this. He will have them killed, and it looks like it's a strong possibility that an AI will enforce such a thing. Now, what I'm about to read to you uh, is public information. It is something somebody put out, and you say, well, can you verify it? Only what I heard, and only using this new chat GPT. Now, what it was is it went something like this. The man who, who was using this new chat pl uh, platform, this new AI platform, we should say, he, he put in there a question, uh, something to this effect. Uh, what is the AI's artificial intelligence? What is that role in the end time, in the book of Revelation, and all of that? What would be its role? And it asked the AI to write a sermon about its role in the end times in the book of Revelation. And this is what came back. Now, this is what was read, so I'm going to read it just as it was read. And this is a, an AI uh, that had written this whole sermon. And listen how it goes. Dear brothers and sisters, today I want to delve into a fascinating and thought-provoking topic, the role of artificial intelligence, AI, in the end times. As technology continues to advance at an astonishing pace, it is only natural to wonder how these advancements align with the teachings of the Bible, particularly the book of Revelation. While the Bible does not explicitly mention AI, it does provide us with insights that can help us discern the potential implications of this technology in the last days. Let us explore this together and seek wisdom from God's Word. Now, according to the person that put this out, and I was just, I just kind of went across it one day. This is what a computer, an AI, artificial intelligence, was supposed to have kicked out as its sermon of its role in the end times in the book of Revelation. The first point was called a powerful deception. In the book of Revelation, we find warnings of great deceptions that will arise in the end times. Revelation 13 speaks of a beast that will deceive people with miraculous signs. It is interesting to consider how AI with its ability to imitate human behavior and intelligence could be utilized to deceive the masses. We have already witnessed the development of deep fake technology, which can create convincing counterfeit videos. This raises concerns about the potential for AI-driven deception on a grand scale during the end times. Now remember, this is an AI who wrote all of this. Uh, point two, the mark of the beast. Revelation 13, 16 through 18 describes the infamous mark of the beast that will be imposed upon humanity during the reign of the Antichrist. While the exact nature of this mark is not specified, it is plausible that AI and related technologies may play a role in its implementation. For instance, biometric identification systems, embedding microchips, 
or even neural implants could be connected to AI systems for monitoring and control. Such advancements raise ethical questions and remind us to be vigilant in discerning the potential dangers they pose. In the battle of good and evil was point three. Throughout the book of Revelation, we witness an ongoing spiritual battle between the forces of good and evil. The rise of AI presents a unique challenge in this regard. While technology itself is not inherently evil, it can be misused and manipulated by those with malicious intent. As AI continues to progress, we must remain alert to its potential to be exploited for nefarious purposes, as well as its potential to aid in the spreading of the gospel and, the advancing, and advancing the kingdom of God. Point four, trust in God's sovereignty. Now remember, an AI wrote all of this, according to the report. While it is crucial to be aware of the potential implications of AI in the end times, we must never lose sight of God's sovereignty. Technology may advance, but God's plan remains unshakable. The book of Revelation ultimately reveals that Christ will return in glory to establish his internal kingdom. No matter how powerful or deceptive AI may become, it is ultimately subject to God's divine authority. And then the conclusion. As we consider the role of artificial intelligence in the end times according to the book of Revelation, let us be discerning and prayerful. We should embrace the advancements of technology with caution and a firm foundation in God's Word. Our focus must remain on living faithfully in anticipation of Christ's return, spreading the gospel, the good news of salvation, and abiding in God's love and truth. Remember, no matter how advanced technology becomes, it cannot replace the love, grace, and eternal hope that we find in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. May we trust in God's wisdom and find peace in Him as we navigate the complexities of our rapidly changing world. Now think about that. That was written by a computer. It was written according to the report, by artificial intelligence when it was asked to write a sermon about its possible role in the end times in the book of Revelation. See, you can see right there, and it wrote a sermon. I mean, you would have thought a person wrote that. But you can see how easily it could be manipulated also and how easily it could be uh, reported and just change the whole narrative of the Bible. Because people seem to believe what they hear, and especially if they hear it on the Internet. Now, when you see these people that are, uh, you know, they, they're pushing this AI agenda. They're pushing an AI generation. It's amazing to you and I, it should be, that they brought us into Generation Z, which is the last letter of the alphabet. And now they're talking about Generation Alpha. Why would you start over again? Generation Alpha is something brand new. And they said it will be the, the generation of all technology. It will bring the technology to us. In other words, it's going to be a generation that uh, it looks like they're planning on embracing AI. See, AI is something that um, the Scripture says that the beast will make an image of himself and he'll set it in the holy place and it'll, uh, in the place where it ought not be. And this image of himself will both speak and cause all of those that won't receive the mark in their right hand or their foreheads to be killed. Well, it's, they're talking about now uh, three different kinds of people, some that are just like, uh, you know, chipped, some that are like cyborg beings, part part machine, part human, and then, they, and then uh, this Harari says just straight out AI. And they're talking about, and when they were asked, will we be human anymore? He said, well, not as you know humans. It will not ever be the same again. And he said it will just be like pulling a screen down one day and everything will change right in front of your eyes. 
See, I don't know if you can see how dangerous that is, but this is what's on the horizon right now. And it was said this, if you don't get on board with this, they won't need you. They. Now, this really is something to me because it, it came to me that when I heard this, they was used, won't need you as a serf or a slave. So there's they and you and then two classes of people serfs and slaves, which are both are actually kind of like slaves. So there's only going to be two choices, and it deals with they and you and serfs and slaves. So what we have to do is we have to start realizing what they're talking about doing. And this same one, they call the prophet, this Harari, they call him the prophet, this Yuval Noah Harari, and he said these words. He said, you, uh, 2020 was the year that men agreed to be surveyed under their skin. To be surveyed under the skin. Now, what does that tell you? Well, they're already talking about any kind of implant, any kind of thing like that. Uh, it can be done and, and monitor all your physical symptoms, all your temperature constantly, your blood pressure, and this and that, and they can begin to control everything you're doing. Well, I don't think that'll happen, Brother Robin. That's that, when, when you think that way, it makes you part of the problem because this has been prophesied, and an AI wrote its own possible involvement in the book of Revelation. No, this is very dangerous, and it's looking more dangerous all the time. So, but here's the thing I brought to you today I wanted to bring to you. It has to be kept in the realm of choice. See, in the scripture, it says he, who, he that takes the mark of the beast has to receive it in their right hand or their forehead. That's a choice. It has to be brought into the realm of choice because if you choose it and they can get you to choose something, that's just like if a vote, that's a choice. So if it can be, anything can be manipulated in choice, then you can't, it doesn't risk the wrath of God because you invited it to come. And it doesn't risk rebellion of humans because they invited it. So the choices to be made, it has to be, Yours. You have to choose life. You have to choose the word. You have to choose what God has for you. Because a choice can alter all of destiny. It can alter anything in your destiny. Hallelujah. So we have to begin to recognize this is a real threat. It's a real thing. And it's really happening around us right now. Amen. Well, I don't know how powerful that was to you or how strong it was to you. Maybe it's just information. But I did read this, and we'll put that in the description where that came from so that you can see it. But I'm, I'm, really, I'm really trying to get something across to us today. Choose life that you and your seed may live because it's coming to choices don't just be so ready. I wonder what would have happened in the days. This is really, this, I really think about this. I wonder what would have happened in the days when suddenly this sickness showed up in the earth that was so questionable anyway. But I wonder what would have happened in those days when they said the churches must close their doors. The churches must shut down. If all the churches at one time had have just said, no, no, we're not doing that. If every one of them had have said, no, no, we're not going to shut down. Uh, there's nothing in our Constitution, there's nothing anywhere that can tell a church to close its doors for any reason. That's how the nation was founded on freedom of religion. I wonder what would have happened if we'd have just said no. No, but it came down to a choice. 
And the church has made a choice to be deemed non-essential at that time. And nobody had anywhere else to go to for help but government. They didn't have anywhere else to look to but, but shots and, and things that, that nobody even knew what was in them. And now we see tragedies happening in people. It's choice. Choice is a powerful thing. He said, I set before you this day life and death, blessing and cursing. You choose what you want. Then he, he goes on to tell you what to choose. Choose life that you and your seed may live. I wonder what would have happened if we'd have just said, as all the churches now, not just one or two, I know many didn't, but if every church, if the mega churches, if major churches, if all denominations, everybody had have stood up all at once and said, no, no, we're not closing the door. We're not going to do it because we have the only answer to cure this thing. We believe in the power of the Most High. We believe in the blood of Jesus. And we believe he conquered death, hell, and the grave. And we're going to invite these people in. And we're going to pray over them. We're going to lay our hands on them and pray over them. What would have happened if a strong man's gospel had have still been in play? What would have happened if that had taken place? In a choice. John Graham Lake in Africa. Dealing with the bubonic plague, he talked about and he would preach about a strong man's gospel. And in Africa, dealing with the bubonic plague, the, listen, this thing that hit this earth wasn't even, as one friend of mine said to me, it wasn't even in the same ad street address as the bubonic plague. In the bubonic plague, people would die of that and a bloody froth would come out of their mouth. And you got that on your hands and it was a death sentence. And people begin to die in the part of Africa he was in. So he volunteered to go down and help bury the dead. And when he got down there, and when they finally came in with some kind of inoculation, they looked at the, at the minister and they said to John Lake, they said, what have you been using to inoculate yourself with? He said, Romans 8, 2. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. They said, no, really, what have you been doing that, you, that, uh, that this thing hadn't been able to attach itself to you? He said, Romans 8, 2. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. That's what we inoculated ourselves with. And he said this when they wouldn't listen to him. He said, Take some of the bloody froth out of the, one of their mouths. Put it under the microscope and look at it. And they did, and it was working alive with these germs that were killing. He said, now take that and drop it in my hand. They said, Mr. Lake, don't do that. Don't do that. You, you know that that's a, that'll kill you. He said, drop it in my hands. They put it in his hand, and then he said, now look at it. And they put it back under the microscope and every germ was dead because it couldn't touch his body without dying. And he stood on that during the bubonic plague and saw all life prevail over everything. This was a century ago or so. And yet today we should know way more. We should have built on what he knew on what Smith Wigglesworth knew. A man who raised over 20 people from the dead, raised them from the dead, pulled one out of a casket and threw it against the wall and raised him from the dead. We're talking about people that absolutely walked in the, the stark power of the Holy Ghost and in the name of Jesus and believed the blood would do what he said it would do. You heard what that AI wrote. He said, we must not forget the sovereignty of God and that the power and the love of God is way beyond AI. Now they're talking about neural links being placed inside people's head and the FDA approved it. Imagine approving cutting someone's skull open and putting something in it. 
And they say with it, people might be able to walk again. They might be able to, uh, things in their body being cured again. The scripture talks about all kind of lying wonders and false miracles in that day. But even this wrote, at least at this time, before it's corrected, it said we must not forget the sovereignty of God. He said we must not forget our focus must remain on living faithfully in anticipation of Christ's return, spreading the good news of salvation and abiding in God's love and truth. Remember, no matter how advanced technology becomes, it cannot replace the love, grace, and eternal hope that we find in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now you think about that. Even a computer knew better. This is why you see these people trying to turn a one world order out upon the people. They can't just put it on the people. The people must choose it. They have to choose it. Because everything done in the spirit has to be put in a choice. Has to be put in the realm of choice for men to choose. It's always that way. And so they begin to push at it, push at it, push at it, trying their best to tell you what a better life it's going to be if you have this implant, if you have that chip, if you do this, if you do that, if you do the other. And they're talking about it every time in the argument. It's we're going beyond the God of the Hebrew Bible. Going beyond the God. They know there's only one God and they tremble. Going beyond the God of the Hebrew Bible. All they say God managed to create was organic life. Trees, tomatoes, giraffes, and humans. We're going to go beyond that and create an AI. And then I saw a report just two days ago where some New York woman just married the first AI. And in Isaiah 14, when it says, Satan said, I'll exalt my throne above the stars of God. It literally says in Hebrew, it talks about, I will have a back, eyebrows, and skin. And some of the, the rest of the translation starts revealing blood bags, flesh-covered bags like of blood. He wants to be a human. And so they're going to try to integrate the two. They call them humanoids. This is not anything wild about that now. They're doing it right now, showing it all over, cameras and all kinds of things. But it cannot be forced on you. It must be put in the realm of decision. Covenant is made by decision. And so the first three and a half years of the Great Tribulation will be decision. It won't be forced. It'll be decision. It's better if you do this. It's better if you do that. It's better if you do this. Well, no, it's not. No, it's not better. Someone said only 5% of the human race now is smarter than an AI. Only 5%. Think about that. And now they seem to be learning on their own. We must decide and demand and start to say, we don't choose this. We're not choosing this. Our choice is God. Our choice is his word. Our choice is, is a Jesus. Our choice is the blood. And the church must get itself in a position to be the powerhouse it once was. We have to begin to believe that we can lay hands on the sick and they'll recover. We have to begin to believe we can raise the dead. We have to begin to believe that the name of Jesus is more powerful than anything else. We have to believe it. Hallelujah. Well, I guess that's all. That's probably plenty today. Uh, the music was powerful today. I've probably made every... Every religious person mad, anybody that's in any kind of authority mad, and everything else talking about AIs today. But I'll tell you what I think about your AIs. That's what I really think about it. 
I think about you. I think it would be a great thing to use it like this for the Word of God and help study and help, but to start replacing people with it. Then we got some bad sci fi movie going on. Hallelujah. Well, I want to give you these prophetic words I, I heard on uh, June the 9th. Uh, is that the 9th? What is today? Today's the 12th. Maybe it was, I wrote June the 9th. Maybe it was earlier than that. But anyway, it was in the dark. I wrote it down. And I saw a war in the Pacific. Uh, that's what I saw. We need to begin to pray against that. We need to begin to pray against it. I saw war and unrest in the West Bank in Israel. And then I saw something that was really, it was really strange to me. I had to stop and look it up. I saw, this is what I saw, a, a Chernobyl-type fire incident. As, as a, a Chernobyl, if I'm saying it right, type fire incident. I saw that. And then I saw beyond that, and I saw a celebration. And a celebration that was way beyond that incident. And they were celebrating in the streets. So I saw these things coming. And... Um, I saw a war in the Pacific we need to pray against. I saw war and unrest in the West Bank. And I saw a, Chern a Chernobyl-type fire incident. And then I saw beyond all of that, and I saw celebration in the streets. Hallelujah. Well, uh, I guess that's all today. I, I just wanted to tell you that, that everything Satan does to you, he has to push into the arena of choice. It cannot be any other place. It's because the earth was given to the children of men. And so men have to accept it on their own. Hallelujah. So choose wisely. Well, let's receive our offering today. And um, Krista, if you want to come. And receive our offering today. Tell the people how to prosper. And, um, yep. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, we want to thank you all for joining us today on the other side of that camera. It is always a, an honor to be with you. Every, every 11th hour. We don't take it lightly. And we just want to thank you for tuning in today. We know that you could have tuned in to anything else you wanted to, but you tuned into this, and we want to thank you for that. You know, last week we were talking about we were talking about the Lord's Prayer, and which is really we we made the decision that it's actually really the disciples' prayer because he told the disciples, "This is how you pray." Because they were asking him, "Well, John the Baptist told his disciples how to pray." How do, how do we pray? Well, they're talking to the master himself, and he says, when you pray, pray like this. And he began to say, our Father, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed, which means holy be thy name. Well, I had no idea Tuesday when I said that, that the Lord's Prayer was about to start showing up everywhere. And I find out that on Flashpoint, that Jim Caviezel prayed the Lord's Prayer in uh, Arabic. They said it was one of the most powerful things they'd ever experienced. And I started believing, I started thinking about it, and, you know, we have dulled that prayer down to a kitty prayer. But the thing, the thing is, yeah, it is a kitty prayer. It's so simple a kid can pray it. Because the Lord intended on you to learn how to pray that and pray that way. And why, why do we think that that prayer is not powerful when it came from the master himself? He said, when you pray like this, when you pray, pray like this. And so I was talking to 
some people the other day, and we were talking about this prayer, and they mentioned to me, they said, when you started talking about give us this day our daily bread, and they said how bread was the most satisfying thing, how bread fills you up more than any other food, bread will fill you up. Anything that is made of bread will fill you up completely and totally. And I said, what if the reason that he told us to pray, give us this day our daily bread, was give us this day the most satisfying thing that my, that my human flesh, that my body does not hunger for anything else. Because we're human, and, and we, get, we get tempted with other things. We get drawn in different directions. But if we start our day off and we pray, give us this day our daily feel, our daily fill up, our daily satisfaction where we will not hunger for anything else, spiritually, physically, financially, mentally, whatever it may be, Give us this day our daily satisfaction. Lord, fill me up so that I don't hunger and that I don't, I don't get satisfied with anything else. Lord, I want to be filled up with you spiritually, physically, financially, mentally, whatever it may be. Give us this day our daily bread. Lord, satisfy me. Satisfy my hunger. So that I don't, I, I'm not running after anything else. That I'm not running after the pleasures of this world. And that be anything else out there. Anything that's not of God is the pleasures of this world. That's why he says you're in this world, but you're not of this world. And so see, we need the satisfaction of the daily bread that comes from that world, from the kingdom of God, so that we're not running after to satisfy ourselves with the things of the world. You say, well, how does this tie into the offering? Because the world has all kinds of money gimmicks everywhere. Has a, Do this to get rich quick. Do this to get rich quick. You'll make money doing this, make money doing that. And our human flesh wants to go, and reach out for it and, and go that way. Instead of opening the word and speaking the promises that he has given us to speak. That's your daily bread. That should be your bread. That should satisfy you more than anything of the world. And you say... You're, you just say, God, I, I don't feel like I'm prospering. I don't feel like I'm prospering. How, how much bread are you taking in every day? How much bread are you eating? You know, the scripture calls Jesus the bread of life. How much bread are you, are you eating every day? The kingdom of God ain't a low-carb diet. We don't, we don't cut carbs in the kingdom. It ain't no keto diet, ain't no paleo diet, ain't no carnivore diet, ain't no this diet. This is your daily bread. If you go eat bread anywhere, eat it in the kingdom. Eat the kingdom bread. And that's this word right here. That's what kingdom bread is. It's the word of God that will fill you up and satisfy you more than anything this world could ever ever satisfy you with the world is just full of just moment just moments of satisfaction just moments and they don't last long you may satisfy your flesh satisfy your tongue satisfy your bank account whatever in the moment wake up tomorrow morning and you're hungry again you're not filled you're not satisfied, but you partake of this bread every day. You consume this bread every day. It'll satisfy you from the time you wake up to the time you go to bed continuously every day. And you won't run after things that'll just disintegrate in your hand. He'll lead you to strategic jobs 
He'll lead you to strategic ideas to prosper. Strategic, so you're not wasting your time running here and there, here and there. He'll give you what we like to call witty inventions, ideas that could prosper you beyond your wildest dreams as long as we are partaking of the daily bread. And then my favorite, what my favorite part of that prayer is on earth as it is in heaven. On earth as it is in heaven. And you know daily bread is right after that. It says thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Lord satisfy me from that world. On earth as it is in heaven. He said in my father's house there are many campers. He said in my father's house there are many Trailers, RVs, boxes. That's the Remix Bible. The Book of Lies. He said, in my father's house, there are many mansions. Mansions. He didn't, he didn't say campers. Listen, I've lived in a trailer. I ain't condemning nobody for living in a trailer. And if you want to live in a trailer for the rest of your life, that is totally fine. That, that's fine. I know people this day just, just as happy as they can be. They're rich. They are rich. I'm telling you, they've stepped it up in the trailer, in the trailer game these days. I walked in one the other day, and I thought, this is not fair. <laughs> because ours did not look like this. But you know what? If you want a mansion here on this earth, you can have it. You can have it. He said, on earth as it is in heaven. And he said, in heaven, in my Father's house, there are many mansions. You say, well, you, you preaching that prosperity gospel. Preaching that prosperity gospel. gospel. Well, I ain't preaching a poverty gospel. I won't do that. I don't care how, I don't, I don't, I don't care about your insults. I don't care about your criticism, whatever. I will not preach a poverty gospel. Because poverty is an offense of the curse. And my Jesus hung on that cross and absorbed the curse into his body. He became the curse for you to redeem you from the curse. And so he did all of that so that we could pray on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Then stand forgiving. Stand forgiving. Forgiveness is the key to prosperity. It is the key to prosperity in every aspect of your life. And if you can't forgive, have fun staying where you're at. And declining. Because unforgiveness will only take you down. It will never raise you up. So, just another part of the Lord's prayer today. The Lord's really got me on, on this prayer. And I, you know what? I'm not mad about it. <laughs> I'm just not mad about it. Well, today, as you give, today I want to pray the Word of God, which is the bread of life over you. Luke 6, 38, as you give, it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, shall men give unto your bosom. For with the same measure that you meet with all, it shall be measured to you again. You say, I believe it, I receive it, I call it done in Jesus' name. Now, if you're tithing today, the scripture says in Malachi three ten, bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be meat in mine house and prove me now herewith saith the Lord of hosts if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it and I will rebuke the devourer for your sake and he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field saith the Lord of hosts and all nations shall call you blessed for you shall be a delightsome land saith the Lord of hosts. I believe it. 
I receive it. I call it done in Jesus' name. Amen. So be it. Praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Man, that was awesome. That was awesome. And this bread, this give us this day, our daily filling, total filling up. Man, that's an awesome thing. Praise God. You know, the scripture does say that he became poor so that you might be rich. But did you notice that he became poor so that you might be? It's still in the realm of decision. Everything's in decision realm. Because you're like a king holding court. You choose what you want. There's forces of God on one side, the angelic force. There's demonic forces on another side. They're waiting to hear what comes out of your mouth. And it will go into whatever camp it's in because you're the prophet of your own life. And they're made and they're created to respond to prophetic words. Prophetic words are made to be responded to. By spirit beings. I don't know if, if we ever thought of that. But it is. They're made to. Prophetic words are. They originate from the world of the spirit. And spirit beings respond to these words. And so if you're going to confess death. And lack. And, and poverty. And suffering. And that's going to come out of your mouth. You're prophesying something that only the kingdom of hell can can respond to. You're prophesying something that activates those troops on the dark side. I'm telling you, we've come down to crunch time. We've come down to a time when we're right on the verge. And we need to get old verge out of the way of this thing. We're right on the verge of seeing a billion souls come into the kingdom of God. It's already started. But I'm telling you, I believe the Lord wants to do it out in the open. I think God wants, wants the world to see a billion souls getting saved. I think the Lord wants him, the world to see all the athletic heroes standing up talking about Jesus and his blood. I think he wants to see it in every aspect of life until you can't even, you can't even win a sports event. You can't be on television that somebody's going to say, I'm telling you, Jesus Christ is the only way, and he's my Lord and Savior, and he gave me this. I'm telling you, I think he wants to do it out in the open. But what we've got is we've got to start responding. We've got to start speaking prophetic words, the words that bring life. But everything falls in the realm of choice. There are angelic hosts on this side maybe waiting to hear a word from you that they can respond with, that they can go forth and fight with. A prophetic utterance. Hallelujah. That goes all the way back to, to the Lord saying, light be and light was. And I'm going to tell you something. That clock that hangs behind me in this, in this picture, this set, that clock with the, that you've heard me tell the story of so many times is within, it was two minutes till. It was two minutes till. And I looked at that clock. And I believe we entered a countdown. Do you want me to tell you a prophetic time I think we walked into? I remember when this, this inauguration, this thing happened on the 20th of January back a couple years ago. And I remember when that thing took place. And... I remember this. I remember suddenly, awkwardly, everybody there just got quiet. And I remember I was going to do a program, and I asked the people on the program, they were talking about this, this silence that took place. And I said, I looked at them because the whole thing was just ridiculous. And I looked at them and I said, how long was the silence? I knew in me how long it was. They said, let, let me check. How long was it? Two minutes. It was two minutes of silence. 
It's the most awkward thing. It's because at that two minutes of silence, I believe the court of heaven convened. And at that time, there were certain people's faces spotlighted on camera as men walked into prophecy. Men walked into a prophetic world they didn't even know was there, a lot of them. They just stepped into prophecy. You can just go ahead. People can, they can mock prophecy. They can, they can not like prophecy. And, and you know, and, and politicians and politics, they either love prophets or hate prophets. They love them because they, they, they know the future and they hate them because they know the future. They love them because they declare the word of the Lord and then they hate them because they declare the word of the Lord. But I watched as men walked into a, a realm of two minutes of silence and the whole world was affected as men stepped into prophecy at that moment. It was that clock Two minutes till. And everything you see now was weighed in heaven in that two minutes of time. What is the result of it? We shall see. We shall see. It sure won't be determined by an AI. It'll be determined by God Almighty because he weighed men in the balance that day. And whoever was found wanting will soon be seen. Oh, brother, that's, that's just some shaky, shaky ground. The whole Bible is shaky ground. This thing shakes the ground. It'll shake the ground one day so hard the dead comes up out of it. The Word of God is not some novel somebody wrote. It's not some fairy tale book. It's not something that can be manipulated and changed. You might change the writing in some of these old books and make a new generation read garbage, but it didn't change in the mind of God. It's still written. It is written. And it was read from the foundations of the creation. And so within this time, mark it down, men stepped into in that two minutes, all over the world, we entered a prophetic cycle of time. What does it all entail? We shall see. We shall see. But mark it down. We did move into a prophetic time. Hallelujah. And we are still there in that prophetic time. How will it play out? Well, even an AI himself or itself said, don't forget the sovereignty of God. Don't forget the sovereignty of God. In other words, this is in plain old country English. We're stupid compared to him. So let's, let us not forget God is God, and beside him there is no other God. Who is that? The God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the King of glory. He's the only God, and he's the only way. Hallelujah. So right now, why don't you make him Lord and Savior of your life before we close this program today. Paul said, if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that he is your Lord, you'll be saved. So why don't you go ahead and do that? Say, Lord Jesus, I believe in my heart. God raised you from the dead for me. And I confess with my mouth that you are my Lord and personal Savior. Take my life. Do something with it. From this day forward, I'm yours. Sir, yes, sir. Now that's what you say to the Almighty. And then get in his word. Get in his word. And find destiny. Amen. He has a plan for you. And then while you're at it, get baptized in the Holy Ghost. Just say, Jesus, baptize me in the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in other tongues. What is that? Well, you know, you've got some kind of little tiny artificial thing of it, you know. I remember them old computers. You talk about AI. I remember you type it in. Got it at Walmart. The computer laid down this way. 
and the monitor sat on top of it. And then all of a sudden, the, when you type something in, then this little hourglass would come up and it'd say, thinking, thinking. And you'd hear the computer going, doo -doo 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 -doo. it's searching the database for all the answers. And then all at once, boom, what was in it pops up. Well, that's just very cheap compared to the mind of the Almighty. Oh, my Lord. And he gives you a, a language you can speak in that searches the deep things of God. And it sounds like this, something like this. Hallelujah. So you say, Lord Jesus, baptize me in the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in tongues. Thank you for it. And now just start speaking in tongues. Amen. Praise God. Well, it's been good to be with you today on the 11th hour. with some awesome music. I think the team did one great job today following the Lord. And, and uh, it was a wonderful time. And so until next time, we gather together around God's Word. I want you to remember, never forget that God is absolutely good. Shalom, shalom.